Okay, so, so we are in a new series, uh, which is starting today. Um, and this new series is, um, it's like while we were praying this morning, um, it, it almost feels like it's a series, it's a topic that is, that is sensitive. Like we, it's like I, I saw um, this, this floor covered in, what's those little things that you stick stuff in the wall with that's got a nail in it? Thumbtacks. So I saw the floor kind of covered with that. And it's like I have to navigate on my big toes around them. Because it is sensitive stuff that we're talking about. It's stuff that every single one of us are experiencing at a different level, but we are all experiencing it. Because if I had to say to you today that our society is in, in a dilemma, I don't have to do a lot of convincing. I don't have to really give you too much information for you to go, yeah, I agree. Because we might agree on different places in regards to it. Um, I, I, I truly believe our society is in a dilemma. And I started reading a book because uh, about three months ago, four months ago, Dave and I, oh, actually, it was after last year's conference, um, we, th th there was a speaker there that spoke about how we have to stand for the principles in the Word. And, and Dave and I spoke about it, and, and how do you communicate that to a body? Um, how do we not alienate our body from society? By, uh, how do we not make us weird? How do we still have Christian values and principles and morals? And, and how do I preach on that? Because there's people that are at so many different places in their lives in regards to some of the social issues that's going on in the world around us. Um, we have, there's people with different beliefs in this congregation because of our backgrounds, because what we've been raised in, where we come from, what we watch, which news channel we watch. Um, influences us differently. There's, there's this, uh, which newspapers you read, which magazines you read, um, the conversations that you're around with on Facebook, the, the discussions you get involved with that are absolutely leading nowhere because just to let you know, you're not convincing anybody of anything on Facebook. <laughs> Side note, just saying. But we are engaged in those things, and they are creating these, these, these pressures in our lives, and, and it's on different levels for every single one of us. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't address them. Simply because there's pressure doesn't mean that we as a body shouldn't have, or as Christ's body, shouldn't be able to say, this is what we stand for, and this is where we're going. So after the conference, and, and Dave and I spoke about it, like I kind of ignored him, um, <laughs> for a while because I, I, I didn't know how to address this. How do you speak without alienating people? Because the last thing I want to do in this body is cause anybody to leave and going, they are this or they are that. or they. I want them to talk about us as being a place of love. I want the world to know that, that our heart is loving people. And I don't want to give anybody any anim am ammunition or anything that they can point back at us and say, just look at this, she told you, that's how they are. So um, I started reading a book, and it's a book by, by Pastor Chris Hodgins. And he's from a church in the Highlands. He, he currently he leads the biggest grow network, the biggest church network in North America. He's the leader of that. He's a phenomenal man. Really, I've got so much respect for him. Um, the person you see preaching and the person you see teaching, I believe that is exactly the same guy. There isn't a, a pastor mask that he puts on on a Sunday. He is the guy that if you ever listen to his teachings or, or read his book, that's who he is. Um, Bish actually met him the first year when he came to Canada. He was trying to steal a book. Um, no, he was trying to buy a book, but his car didn't work. So he thought he's just going to put it in his jacket. Um, no, he didn't. I'm joking. <laughs> Everybody would like, what? And he's a pastor? No. Um, so so Bish was uh, arrived here from South Africa, wanted to, wanted to buy a book at the airport, but because he had a South African card that's worth nothing, um, um, he tried to pay for it, and they went and they said, no, it's not working, it's not working. And he said the next moment he saw a hand come just through past his hips, kind of just with the cards like this. Somebody waving their card like this. And it was Pastor Chris Hodges saying, hey, I just want to bless you with this book. Which is awesome to me. Right? Somebody just, just being aware. And, and immediately it's me, it tests me of who he is as a person. So, so for me, I want to tell you this book, I value the person that wrote it. If you want to buy it, please do. It's a good book to read. It's called The Daniel Dilemma. It's written in, in um, 2017, so it's only a year old. It's very relevant. It's very applicable. 
Um, and uh, I encourage you to read it. So, so the question that it starts off with is, is how to stand firm and love well. That was my, my kind of uh, difficulty. How do we stand firm and love well in a culture of compromise? That's a big statement. How do we do that as a body? Love well. We want to love people. We want to love them well and not compromise. Because the reality is the culture that we're living in is increasingly moving away from God. It is. It is increasingly moving in a direction that's not closer to God. It's actually distancing more and more and more. Um, and there's a tension in this culture because we want to live godly lives, lives that, that's godly. And how about godly lives? Don't, don't um, think by godly, I mean, like in the old way of thinking of godly, you know, prunes, you know, like a, a lemon that's sucking the life out of people. That's not godly. Like, right? have you seen those people, their lips, they've got the, the permanent cracks because they are just so, so sucking the life out of people. That's not godly lives. If some of you have them, <laughs> oil of low lay <laughs> or something like that. Okay. So, so God does not want us to live godly lives in that way. Godly lives means that we are wearing everything that Jesus said we are supposed to be marked with. And we've spoken about that. We, that's what God wants from us. So, so this book of Daniel speaks about this. Um, and the book of Daniel is a great book. If you want to read another good book and you don't want to read the Daniel dilemma, read Daniel. <laughs> it's good. It's in the Bible. Um, the book of Daniel is made up of 12 chapters. The first six chapters, I'm convinced all of you know. And you know why I know you know them? Veggie tales. Veggie tales. Right? You know veggie tales. We, we, we know of, of broccoli, celery, and you know of the, uh, Daniel in the lion's den, and you know of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? You, you know of them because you either have kids or grandkids that have watched VeggieTales. So you know the first six books. I think most of you won't have a problem with the first six books. Really easy to read, and it's great. It's about the history of the nation, how they got into the dilemma that they were in. The next six, six books is uh, sex books. Um, <laughs> is the Book of Lamentations and the Song of Solomon's. No, <laughs> totally different books. So the next six books. Let me articulate accurately. Peter Piper wants to eat peppers, is books about prophecy, prophetic books. It's about the end times, a little bit harder. So, so Daniel itself as a book has historical, but it also has prophetic. Now, I want to give you some information that you need to understand um, regarding the Old Testament, because this will help you to understand Daniel also. So the Old Testament is made up of, of books, and, and they are not in a chronological order, meaning it's not like the time frame, right? So, so it's not starting at zero or 4,000 or five or 6,000 before Christ, and, and they're not put in place like date-wise. Um, the books are actually put together based on categories. The first five books of the Bible written by Moses are the books of the law. So, so that is kind of where we learn the history of God's people. We learn about creation, where the law comes from. It's historical books. The next um, couple of books that we find in the Bible are the poetry section. And, and this is why some people are confused, because we'll read about David, and you'll hear that David died. And then suddenly David's writing in Psalms again. You're going, what? That, what? David come back to life again. What happened with David? How did he, how's he writing again? It's not chronological. It's based on, on the type of books that they are. So you've got historical. Then you've got the poetry section, which is Psalms, Proverbs, Lamentations, Ecclesiastics, and um, 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 so, Song of Psalms. So, so, so those are the next group. And then after that, you've got the prophets. You've got the major prophets, and you've got the minor prophets. Now, the minor prophets, they aren't minor because the words that they gave were less important. It wasn't like, oh, you're just a minor prophet. I'm not going to listen to you. Give me the major prophet. No, the minor prophets are just shorter, shorter prophetic books, easier to read. Um, the major prophets are long stuff, like it's, it's long prophetic words given. 
So you've got the minor prophets, you've got the major prophets. And then we get to, to the New Testament. Now, so we've got historical, we've got poetry, then we get into to, um, the prophets, minor and major. The book of Daniel has got history in it, but it is in the prophetic section. Do you, honest, do you know why it is done that way? Because God knows exactly what He's doing. God said the history of the people in the time of Daniel is prophetic for us to look towards for our times. The history is the prophetic. And we've heard this many times, history repeat itself. And that is really, Daniel is history repeating itself. Generation after generation, time frame after time frame. We see that history, what they were going through during that time, suddenly becomes present again in our times. And that is exactly what happened for Daniel. They rejected God, and the price they paid for rejecting God was God rejected them. They rejected God's ways and his, the, the ways he was doing things and his principles and his morals. And with them rejecting that, the consequence of rejection of that is there is a consequence of one where we are separated from God. And those people, the, the, the nation of Israel, went through that consequence. And I honestly think, I think Canada is, is at the brink, at the threshold of, of rejecting God again. What's very interesting is Canada is built on Christian principles and morals. It's actually in, in some of our statements, you know, some of the founding fathers of Canada declared um, in 1921, um, they declared the following, um, Ad Marius... That thing, ad mari skew, ad mari, which translates from sea to sea. And it comes out of Psalm 72 verse 8. It says, may he, God, rule from sea to sea and from river to the end of the earth. It's in our parliament building etched on the walls. There are many scriptures in, in the constitution of Canada. This is, we, are, we are supposed to be a Christian nation, a nation under God. Yet, as a nation, 4% attend church. 4% of a population of 37.5 million people attending church, feeling that there's value in spending their time with God. And, and I honestly think that what we read in Daniel, it's not a warning for us in the sense of you guys better be scared of what's happening. But it's for us as believers being aware of what we should do in times when that happens. Because we, unfortunately, cannot control 96% of the people. We cannot go and force their will and squeeze them into the church. We can simply stick to the convictions that God and to the wisdom that God gives us. What do we do in times like that? What are we supposed to do? So here's Daniel. Um, Daniel chapter 1. It starts this way. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judea, Nebuchadnezzar, king of, don't correct my reading, <laughs> king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So they were a defeated nation for 70 years. For 70 years, they became slaves of Babylon. They were exiled from their country, they were moved away, and they became the slaves of the Babylonian kingdom. And the Lord delivered Joachim, king of Judea, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put it in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz. Anybody want to correct me on that one? Thank you. <laughs> Chief of his court officials to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Now, this is such an interesting thing that, that is happening, right? So now a nation is exiled. They're exiled into slavery. Uh, the the um, 
empire of Babylon is super strong. They are destroying nations everywhere. So they're bringing these people into Babylon as slaves. Now, as they walk through this whole process, they kind of go, you, 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 come this way. The rest of you keep going. Now, all the good-looking guys, all the guys that have, looks like they've got intellect, all the guys that, that come from nobility, they dressed well, they appear well, they look like they could be well-informed. We are looking for the people that can become influence, influers, people that can influence their own nation. We want to pull them out of the group, and we're going to teach them a new language, and we're going to teach them a new culture. And then after three years, we're going to put them back into their society. Because we want to change their society. Um, we are approaching um, 11 o'clock. I want to call Ken Corey up because we just want to, want to um, respect and honor uh, the people um, and the men and the women that died serving this great country. Ken. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, if you could all stand for me. Give a little prayer. Our Father God, we thank you for the incredible love that you share with us. We know that your love has no volume. It's always on full blast. Father God, as you know today, on the 11th day, of the 11th month, of the 11th hour, we like to honor and remember those men and women that died and those that were injured and those that fought for the freedom that we're all so happy to share today. At this time, I'd like to give one minute of silence Father God, in closing, we ask that you provide a hedge of protection around our Canadian men and women, our soldiers that are currently serving in Malia in a very, very difficult situation. We want to remember those, remember those that have fallen, remember those that are still with us. In the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to take your seats again. So, so these people, when you get, get back to, to Babylon, God's people were exiled. They meant that they left their own country taken as slaves into a different country. And the first part of the slavery that they had to go through is there was separation that happened. Nobility, royalty, people that looked good, people of influence. They felt that could influence became more important than the rest of them. They got special treatment. They got diet plans and personal trainers. They got makeup artists and special designers. They were placed in positions where people could look at them and go, wow, I want to be like that person. They became people of influence because they were influenced by a new language and a new culture. And the enemy strategy has not changed. He takes people that we look and we admire it because of the way they look or because of how intelligent they might be, 
And suddenly those people's value increases in this world. And the reality is God's value for every single one of us is exactly the same. He does not honor looks more than he does from one person more than he does another person. God values every single person. So the enemy wants to do this. He wants to to bring a difference. He wants to bring um, a separation. He wants to bring uh, classes into our society and into our lives. And then he wants to bring people of influence that he can influence to influence us. So the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of the, the court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from royal families and nobility. Young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, um, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Is it because the king didn't want to be around stupid people or ugly people? No. The king knew, how, how am I going to change a whole nation that I've just exiled? Put people in front of them that I can influence that they will listen to. Um, so, so he did that. And the king assigned them daily amounts of food and wine from the king's table. Um, they were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those men were, that were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, four men. And we know those four men pretty well. Some of you know their, their new names. You didn't know their old names. Dave knows their, their old names also. He told me earlier this week. Um, and, and what we should understand from these four guys is that if we don't look at their lives and learn from it, we could fall into the same temptations and the same difficulties as, as the rest of the nation and many others of them fell into. So the, the, the chief official gave them new names. This is very interesting to me, and, and I'm just going to focus on this section for today, and, and then we'll stop after that. He gave them new names, and he said to Daniel the name Balthasar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Gave them four new names. Now, what's in a name? Why did he, give, why did he change their names? Because in a name is ownership. Names shows you who you belong to. Um, it's, uh, it's like, uh, you know, your name. Like, I am Andreas Georgiades Basson. Those are my names. Um, when somebody calls that out, I'm going to respond. I was, or oh, I am, the son of Doreen and Willem Diedrich Basson. Uh, my mom is actually Dorothea Gertreda Hendrina Basson. But... I am theirs. I am their son. I remember in high school, um, sitting in the class, and some of you uh, might rec- know what this feels like, um, and we as a grade 12 group of boys decided that in order to keep the grade 10 boys in check um, and to keep them at the place where they understand who's in control in the school, if we found any grade 10 boy acting out, we would wedgie him during break. But not just a little bit. We would wedge him until he knows he's been wedged. Um, and I remember sitting in the class, and it, and it was working. It was, it was effective, because we would hear of a grade, a grade 10 boy acting out, and then in break, the guys would go, we'd go sort it out. He won't act out again. I remember sitting in class and hearing the following announcement. Will the following students please report to the principal's office? Andreas Georgiades Basson. Now, you know when you hear your second name, (laughs) something's up. Nico Willem Reinach. Andre Stefan Terblanche. And there were six of us. And I remember going to the principal's office. We all kind of in the same group, go, going into the hallway. We, we, we wore uniforms in school. And most South African schools wear uniforms. It's something that we do. We walk in lines. When the bell rings, everybody gets into a line. Another bell rings, we walk to our class. A bell rings, you sit down, class starts. Bell rings, get in line. So it's all very ordered, structured. Uniforms, very ordered, structured. And I remember going to the principal's office, and as we approached the principal's office, we saw all six our parents. 
And I was not confused whose I was. <laughs> I knew which one was my mom and which one was my dad. So I walked to them, and now you have to wait until the principal calls you into the office. So as we walked into the office, we sat down. The principal said, um, Mr. and Mrs. Basson, um, we want to tell you about something that Andreas has been doing during um, uh, break at school. Um, and they, in South Africa, there is still, still what do you call it, um, when they spank you? Corporal punishment. We still have corporal punishment in South Africa. So, so um, are you aware of what was going? Uh, are you aware of this? No, we're not aware of this. Um, Andreas, what you've got to say to yourself? I'm so sorry. Um, you know, really apologize. We won't do it again. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Now, um, parents, do you consent? Give me consent to um, spank him. You can do it, or I can do it. You can choose. Um, and I, I always hoped my, my mom said that they will do it, but they never did. Because uh, they can go light, right? They can just go, pook. Um, and then they say, no, principal, you do it. And then the principal will open up his, his closet. And then you can pick. There's three different rods that you can pick out of. You can have um, the, um, the one that it's, it's actually, it looks like... Um, you know, when you put, when you make beef and you put it uh, like a big piece of beef, no, no, like a beef casserole almost, like it's like a thick little, it's like a plank with a handle that's thick and it's got round at the front, and when it, when, when you get hit by it, yeah, it's a paddle, no, but it's not the paddle that, that's the thing, it's what happens to your butt, a casserole, a beef casserole, it swells up. Right, so it's like a big round hoop that swells up. So it's one hoop. Or you can pick thin lips, which is a thin rod. When you get hit by that one, it's look like you've got two thin little lips on your butt. And then you've got tires. Tires is a thicker rod. When you get hit by that one, it's like two thick tire lines. And we would also, it sounds like I was in there a lot. <laughs> but we would go and compare afterwards. We would. Everybody runs to the washing room, drop the pants, check in the mirror, check mine, right? <laughs> Everyone to see their lines on their butt. Um, you know, I loved it. <laughs> Just the, the, the boys getting together knowing, oh, we're in trouble now, but man, we're going to have stories to tell after this. The point is, <laughs> nobody else owned my name. I was responsible for what I did. There is ownership in names. Many of you here today are sitting owning things in regards to your name that are not supposed to be yours. You are owning things regarding who you think you are because that's what you've been called by a culture that will change your name. I had another friend that was with me in school. Um, he ha had a bit of a disability. He was actually, he had a, a special teacher with him. His disability was when he closed his eyes, he drops over. He just, he just falls over. Um, they said he had an imbalance. There was an imbalance in his, in, his, in his brain. So if he closes his eyes, he loses complete balance and he, and he just drops. He doesn't pass out. He just falls over, which was uh, terrible. Um, and the kids, kids mocked him for it. So for him... Instead of wanting to be mocked, he decided, well, I'm going to take this on. And he started learning kickboxing. And he actually became the South African kickboxing champion for, for his, his, his weight. Um, and the reason he started taking kickboxing was because he wanted to beat anybody up who mocked him. So he, he got a name. Do not mess with that guy. Do not laugh at him. Don't even look, like, try not to look in his direction. Inside, this guy is the softest guy that I know. But because of what happened to him, his name changed from being a good guy to being a bully. He got saved um, when we were in university. And as he got saved, one of the things that he had to change was the identity that culture gave him, that society has placed upon him. Name changes is something, it's a strategy that the enemy has for every single one of us. He wants to change your name, and he wants to change your identity. Because if you can change your name and your identity, you will never be who God created you to be. You will always be something else. And I want you to know, know that when you accept Christ, you do have a new name. You are a child of God. 
He calls you son and he calls you daughter. You have a new identity in Christ. The old has passed away and we have to learn what the new is. So culture's first agenda is to change your identity. It tries to make you believe something that is not true about yourself. When we look at the names that God changed, we look at Daniel, was called Belthesazar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, Azariah was called Abednego. Every one of these names had a meaning. And it's so incredible to, uh, you way ahead, just go back please. Um, first one, Daniel. When we look at the name Daniel, what does the name Daniel mean? Because there's a meaning in the name. Daniel means God is my judge. God is my judge. Now, for some of us going, well, I don't know if I like the name. What well, actually what Daniel, Daniel was saying is, I listen to his authority. I am under his authority. He is the one that I am submitted to. And it's not the judge in the way that we think that he's the one judging us. It is saying, I am submitted under you, God. Now, look at the way his name changed. Balthasar. His name became Lady Protect the King. That's so interesting. That he went from, God, I'm submitted under you, to Lady Protect the King. They gave him a girl name. And what you will find in every pagan culture in the world throughout history, every single one of them, you will find that the first thing that they attack is they bring gender confusion into society. Roles are reversed. Men are no longer men. Women are no longer women. The roles that the Bible has given us as husbands, as fathers, as leaders, suddenly those roles are no longer there. As mothers, as teachers, as comforters, as nurturers, as life, those functions are no longer there. And there's gender confusion that happens. It's one of the first things that happened to them. The name changed. The second name I want to show you is the name Hananiah, which means Yahweh has been gracious. Now, Yahweh is I am. When, God, um, when Moses said, God, who are you? He said, I am. That's the first time we read of Yahweh. Yahweh, I am gracious. So Hananiah means God is gracious to me. He is so good. His grace is undeserved. I am loved by him. It is so great that I know I don't deserve his love, but he's gracious on me. Look at how his name changed. Shadrach. I am fearful and scared of God. God is not for you. He is against you, waiting to see when he can catch you out so that he can punish you. From grace to condemn in a name. Mishael, who is what God is? Notice the confidence in the statement, oh my God is awesome, who is like him? We're just saying, I've seen you move, you move a mountain, who is like him? Who can do that? God, you're greater than anything ever created. And look to what it changed. Um, Mishach, I am despised, humiliated, from confidence to cowardly, and disgrace and being ashamed. What's in a name? Azariah, Yahweh, I am, helps me. He is my helper. Man, when he is with me, my whole life is successful in the name. Look at to what it changed. Abednego, servant of Nebu, meaning you will be a slave to whatever you choose to be a slave to. I'm going to become a slave to um, addictions, to unforgiveness. I will be a slave to bitterness. I will be a slave to anger. I will be a slave to doubt and, and constant criticism. I can become a slave to over-criticizing people. 
I can bec- you can become a slave to anything you allow. I have become a slave. Meaning, I am captured by it and I can't just get away from it. So, so let's look at the four names together, and I love this. So the four names is Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and, and Azariah. This is what the names mean together. Now, look at the prophetic part of this. Understand how, how this plays a role in us. God is my judge, and He is gracious towards me. Who is what God is? I have seen you move mountains. He is my help. When He is with me, my whole life is successful. What statement is that for us as believers to have? But now they've been taken into a new culture. They've become slaves. This new culture is teaching them a new language. And he wants them to think differently. And see how their thinking changed in the names. My identity has changed. And I am confused about my gender. This causes me to fear God. I am despised and humiliated. I no longer have any confidence in Him, in His ways, or in myself. And therefore, I will be a slave. Isn't that amazing? I honestly think that name changes is taking place in our society today. So what do we do? When culture shifts, we have to know who we are. When culture shifts, we have to know who we are. And where do we find out who we are? In God's word. It's the only place. It's the only place. I'm going to finish there because if I go on, we'll stay here till Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> well, now that you've said that, everybody get comfortable. <laughs> It is so important for us. Honestly, um, as believers, I want us to understand it's so important for us. God is not, he's not calling us to, to um, change other people to influence society. He didn't call Daniel and say, Daniel, okay, Daniel, what I want you to do is I want you to be like a spy incognito and influence them my ways. God said, no, I want you to know who you are. Know who you are. For us as believers, we need to know who we are and not be threatened by what the world is saying about us because it makes us shy for being who we are. There are so much negative talk about Christianity and Christians and, you know, preachers and pastors. And this week again, somebody put some idiotic thing on Facebook that I'm so glad Garnet responded to it because it was perfect and accurate. Because it was just, it's, why do we as believers bad mouth Christianity? Rather, work on yourself. Work on who you are in Christ Jesus. Stop pointing fingers at the other Christians. First of all, because they are part of the same vision and purpose, which is to advance God's kingdom. If we cannot build up each other's identity about who we are in Christ Jesus, the world is not going to do it. We are supposed to bring forth, like encourage, uplift, bring forth who God has called us to be. So for us as a body, as we continue on in the study, we're going to affirm who we are. That's where we're starting next week. I want you to know who you are. And we'll start with that. And then we're going to move from there. How do we handle... um, Different issues that's going on in society and culture. How do we address them? Because we need to address them. We can't, what what happens when we don't address them is like we're sweeping it under a blanket and it becomes these massive things that you're kind of awkwardly standing on. And you can't, you can't walk around anymore because we don't know how to address them. We have to address them. And it comes from confidence in who we are in Christ. But it does not come from condemning other people. It comes from know who we are. Know who we are in Him. Know who you are in Him. Amen. Amen. I pray to Him. I want to call them to the front, please. This morning, if, if I do think that God wants to deliver some people regarding some names that they've been given, that's been spoken over them in the past. There might be people here that, that in the past you've heard you'll amount to nothing. 
uh, you know, you might be one of the ones that stayed in the queue that just became regular slaves. That just became one of the guys that had to go dig and work in the field. And you're thinking, my identity is, well, I'm not as good as the other ones that got pulled out that might be elite, like my brother or my sister. Look at how successful they are. Look at how much they've achieved. Listen, those are all nonsense and lies about you that you are believing regarding yourself. And the first step towards becoming who you are in Christ Jesus is getting rid of the lies first. That's why the searching for purpose, not purpose, purpose. The searching for purpose is so vital because it comes from your identity. You cannot find your purpose unless you know your identity. So I want to encourage you, if you need prayer, please come to them. Let them pray with you and for you and over you and agree with you that the lies that has been spoken over your life are lies. You're not a good student. Nonsense. Right? Nonsense. You will never get married. Absolute nonsense. God's purpose is for us to be with somebody because God said it's not good for man to be alone. You will never have children. Well, if you're 80, I hope not right now. But if you're younger and you want children, God said that I can plant the seed. I honestly believe that we've seen miracles in people's lives. You'll never get healing from this. Nonsense. You will always walk with a limp. You are not called a limp. You are called healed in Christ Jesus. So let's, let's break that name because if you think you will always be overweight, nonsense. You can be healthy. Your name is not overweight. Right? You, you will always struggle with this thing or that. It's absolute nonsense. It's not God's identity for you. But it starts with you being willing to stand up and say, I want, I want to pray with somebody regarding this and break this over my life because I'm tired of being labeled that way. It's not who God says I am. Amen? So let's all stand up and I'm going to close first in prayer. And then if you want prayer, please come forward. That'll be great. It will be good for you. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you are not nervous in heaven. With wiggling your thumbs, wondering, what are you going to do? I know you're in control, Lord. And I know you've given us an incredible identity in you. One that is so valuable. One that is powerful. One that is beautiful. The way you've made us. And Father, this morning, I want to pray that whatever lies we are believing regarding ourselves, that somebody might have spoken, a parent, a teacher, a colleague, um, people who say they are friends, um, whoever it might be, Father, whatever has been said over me, we want to break it in the name of Jesus this morning. And we only want the truth in our, our identity regarding who you say we are. So, Father, I want to pray that the Holy Spirit will bring into the hearts of the people here this morning that have been struggling with things. And I pray that you will give them the courage and the boldness to step forward and receive prayer and break those lies in the name of Jesus. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Everybody have a wonderful Sunday. We see you next.